Good evening and welcome to the Democratic primary for state representative for Chittenden 8-1, which is the Essex district, right? And that does that include Essex Junction? Uh, it doesn't. It's a little mostly bit not. of it. Okay. Mostly not. All right. But so this is primarily Essex and we have two seats in the Democratic primary. The election is the 11th of August and we have three candidates here this evening. Mary Beth Redmond, who is an incumbent, Brian Sheldon and Tanya Vihovsky. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to uh, go right to the questions. And the opening question is, why are you running and what qualifies you for the position? And Tanya, if you don't mind starting, that would be quite great. Thank you. I would love to, thank you. So my name is Tanya Bihovsky and I use she, her pronouns. I'm running to represent Essex because I believe that every voice must be represented in order for us to make truly transformative change. And when I look to Montpelier, I see that my voice and the voices of too many are missing. Essex is my home and I grew up here. And like many young professionals, I struggled to afford to return home after college. I did return to Vermont when I graduated in 2009. And I'm so happy that I was finally able to return back to my community of Essex to live and work for the past six years. Sadly, getting to this point was more difficult than it should be, like it is for many young people, some of whom are never able to return home. And since returning, I've seen too many people struggling, both here and across our state. The core of that struggle comes from a dysfunctional and failing system. But I believe that we can fix this system by bringing together a diverse coalition of perspectives in order to build a real solutions that work for all of us. I'm running to make sure that women and young people, people living on fixed incomes, people struggling to get by, people of color, and every person who has been left behind feels like they have their voice heard in Montpelier. For too long, our leadership has not been truly representative of our communities, and it's time that we shifted our view of who gets to lead. As a social worker and a longtime activist and organizer, I know how important it is that we all get a seat at the table. I've seen daily the real human cost of our failed economic, failed health care, failed housing, and failed environmental policies, and I feel like enough is enough. I felt it when I ran in 2018, and even more now a responsibility to lift up the experiences of struggling and marginalized Vermonters to bring them with me to Montpelier. Thank you so much, Tanya Vihovsky. Mary Beth Redmond, why are you running and what qualifies you for the position of House, uh, House Repre of Repre Representative to the House in Vermont? Mm, thanks, Lauren Glenn. Um, I'm really thrilled to be running for re-election. I'm a first-term legislator, and we're finishing up. Um, we're going back into session and finishing up in August, or actually September. But I have loved um, my legislative work in serving my Essex constituents. Um, I believe that Essex deserves um, a person with a sharp mind, a good advocate advocate and communicator. I believe that through the COVID pandemic, I have worked really, really hard to um, link my constituents to unemployment systems, to have their needs, their food security needs taken care of. Um, it's been quite a, a, an amazing experience of providing strong constituent service. Um, I sit on the House Human Services Committee. So many of the social safety net systems that people rely on um, to support themselves and live dignified lives were impacted by COVID. Um, so I spent a lot of time kind of delving into those systems, looking at how to shore them up with my committee members and looking at how we can revision them for the future. Um, I'm a journalist by background um, and also a nonprofit professional. So um, journalism skills are great skills for um, having you ask good, strong, hard questions, really analyzing and synthesizing information. I love to look at systems holistically not just in silos, kind of system and agency by agency. So I'm really looking forward to returning to Montpelier and continuing the deep work of um, systems change that will really lift up Vermonters because I believe no one in Vermont should be left behind. Thank you very much, Mary Beth Redmond. Brian Sheldon, welcome. Why are you running? Uh, and what qualifies you for the position of the House? Uh, well, Lauren Glenn, thanks for hosting us and thanks for having me. I appreciate the honor of being able to speak to you and to the public. Thank you for hosting. Um, the reason why I'm running is I'm tired of the attacks on democracy that are going on through the throughout this country. 
And um, the just what happened yesterday, yesterday, the day before in Portland um, is yet another example of why um, people need to stand up, people who can. Um, I, I think that my experience as a small business owner and a, and a software engineer are what are going to make me a strong advocate for Essex in Montpelier. You know, m- many people have, to- have asked me, why do you call yourself a software engineer on your campaign materials? Are you worried that's going to make you sound a little dorky? Well, it's a big part of who I am. I knew I wanted to be a programmer when my parents got their first IBM PC through the IBM Employee Purchase Program. Throughout my career, I've used computers to solve problems, whether that's to take your credit card securely at, at a gas pump, whether it was to make sure New Jersey healthcare providers got reimbursed correctly, or to counting every American in the 2010 US Census. It's the solving problems to me that's interesting, not the computers. And the skills you learn um, doing software consulting are 100% applicable to the, the, to the legislature. When you're writing software, you very rarely write all of it yourself. You have to work with a team. I'm usually on the development team and we have our priorities. The test team has found a different collection of bugs and um, you have to prioritize those. Sales team knows that they can make more money if you just write them one more feature. So listening to all those groups and deciding the priorities and what to do, that's what I do every day. And I can't think, given what's going on in the world today, I can't think of a better qualification. And I'll listen to everyone, use science and data to help pick the right outcome. All right, thank you very much. I'm going to um, go on to this question, which is a big one, but maybe you can answer it fairly quickly, which is, we'll start with you, Mary Beth. What will be different for the people of your district or the state as a whole, because you've been reelected? And just before you do that, Kevin, you might not be muted. Go ahead, Mary Beth. So I think the the biggest thing that I have really worked to do over the past session is really be in great communication with my community. So particularly with COVID and everything that came down, you know, all of the daily changes that were coming from the administration and from the health department, my job was really to take that information, synthesize it and communicate it in a clear, comprehensive and ongoing way with my constituents. And I feel like I've done a really good job at that through Front Porch Forum, through Facebook, through community conversations that I host with my my colleagues from Essex. Um, So I feel like advocacy and communication, like that's something, my job is to connect Essex residents with their government and to feel like they have a voice there. I get back to every single people or, you know, every single person who reaches out to me with a thoughtful response. So I feel like I've opened up communication and really given people a sense that their voice is being heard in Montpelier. So they can count on that. And um, certainly I will be representing whatever the interests and concerns of Essex are as I bring, you know, as I engage in each issue in Montpelier. Um, so, you know, that I, I think communication is a key thing. A lot of people feel cut off from what's going on in Montpelier. They don't really know what's going on. They don't know how to connect in. They don't know how to have their voice heard. And I feel like I work very hard to kind of open up and make our um, state government more accessible to people. Thank you very much. Brian Sheldon, what will be different if you're elected to the legislature next year at this time? Well, as a, as a software engineer, one of the things I bring to the table are practical solutions to complex problems. Um, as I said, I don't think there's a better time to have elected officials who believe in science and know how to analyze data. Um, so a, a second thing is, th- I think all indications are that the House will be in the hands of the Democrats come January. I'm the chair of the Essex Democrats. So I've already been building relationships with um, people we've come to speak in Essex, like Mitzi Johnson, Tim Ash, and Secretary Condos. So you know that I'm going to that I'm going to be in the room for Essex when the solutions are crafted. But more concretely, if I'm elected, assuming COVID-19 doesn't take up all of the two years, the state's going to have a paid family leave program. I am running to replace one of the 51 votes that sustained Governor Scott's veto. My goal is to be the hundredth vote for paid family leave. Thank you very much. Tanya Vihovsky, what will be different because you have become a legislator next year at this time? Yeah. 
As someone who grew up here and as a young woman trying to stay and build a family here, I will shift the makeup of our representation to start to be more inclusive and representative of our state. We talk about a lot about wanting to ensure that young people are able to stay here and thrive here. And in order to accomplish that, we have to have the voices of those people who are struggling at the table. I will bring that voice along with my experience and innovative solutions. As a longtime community member and a local small business owner who works with youth and young adults from our community, I will also bring the voices of the many who are often left behind and feel shut out from Montpelier. In my work as a social worker, my job is to support people to navigate difficult systems and the many crises that come up for them in their life. And I will take those tools with me to Montpelier to help us have a more informed approach to solutions for our community and our state as we navigate this crisis and the ones to come. Additionally, in my work as a community organizer, I've built the skills and tools needed to bring all voices to Montpelier. We can make transformative change and build an Essex and a Vermont where we all have what we need and all of our voices matter. I want to create a system that looks like all of us so that we together can build a future for the Vermont that ensures we are all heard. Even when we don't see eye to eye, we will build collaborative solutions that no one of us could have envisioned on our own. Can you explain to me who you're talking about when you say all and when you say representation hasn't happened? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our our current state house, the makeup is is predominantly older white men, and that is not representative of our whole state. We need more young people. We need more people of color. We need more people who have struggled within our systems. And there's a lot of structures in place that make that really difficult. And having had some of those experiences as a young person who struggled to come back, I think I bring ideas around how to solve those things simply having had those experiences, as well as the work within my social work practice with communities that are often silenced and marginalized. I'm going to go right to the gun rights question, because it is whenever there's a public hearing on gun rights in Essex, a thousand people watch it on YouTube. So it's an issue that is of, of great concern. So Brian, why don't we just start with you? What's your position on gun control legislation and do you think there should be further legislation or can you comment on the debate that has happened in your community on this topic? Yeah, you know what? Uh, the way that question is posed sort of, uh, you know, with due respect, reflects on how we've lost the thread on guns in this country. Um, my concern is with uh, the prevention of gun violence. And I think any represented, representative from Essex should be so concerned. This is not just a national issue. It's an issue in Essex too. Alicia Shanks was shot at Essex Elementary School in this district in 2006. And Andrew Black took his own life with a fresh, freshly purchased gun in 2018. You know, the Supreme Court has said, this is a quote, like, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. It's not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever for whatever purpose. And that's not RBG. It's not even Breyer. That's Scalia. Most Vermonters believe we need stronger gun safety protection than we have now. We're not as divided as we might think. And what with some limits that even Scalia would find constitutional, both Alicia and Andrew would still be alive. I testified in Montpelier in support of a waiting period for handguns, and a waiting period for handgun sales would limit impulsive gun suicides. And we also know that they work for gun homicides. The federal waiting period, while it, while it was on the books, reduced gun homicides by 17%. Now, that waiting period bill, yeah, it passed the House and Senate, but it was vetoed by Governor Scott. That's why flipping this seat is so important and putting a Democrat in this seat is so important. Governor, uh, we need more Democrats or a go Democratic governor in order to make Essex residents more safe. Thank you. Tanya Vihovsky, your view on this question, and perhaps it is not framed properly, the question is about gun control legislation. Um, your view on that question or the question of safety, gun safety? Absolutely. As someone who grew up in Vermont in a family that were responsible gun owners and hunters, and as someone who is a gun owner myself, I believe that we can protect the recreational tradition in our state while also enacting common sense legislation like waiting periods 
closing the gun show loophole and ensuring safe community ordinances and mandated safety training for responsible gun ownership. I personally took part in many hours of professional training before I felt like it was safe to bring that kind of thing into my home. And I think that that should be the case across the board. I don't think we are as divided. I think that we need to think about not being reactionary and be effective and that there is a way to honor the traditions that are often cited in the arguments against gun legislation while also ensuring that our communities and our people and our students are protected and safe from violence. And we need to furthermore, when we talk about weapons, work towards demilitarizing our police so that people feel safer and that our public safety systems are universal and actually protect them so that no one is forced to feel like they have to protect themselves. Thank you so much. Mary Beth Redman, your view on gun control legislation question. Do you think we've done enough? What's your position? How would you frame the frame the issue? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we made some progress a few years ago in Vermont. And, and just to say off the bat, I am, you know, totally supportive of people owning a gun and, and being a safe owner, for sure. Um, I'm not interested in taking people's guns away, which frequently is how the argument gets framed at a lot of the public hearings in Essex. Um, but I do believe that we need deeper safety, not just for our children, but for all of us. Um, and I really, you know, I, I've worked over the last two years, we have tried to bring um, legislation around closing the Charleston loophole, um, which is a serious gap in the background check process. Um, you know, we, COVID kind of took over the attention of everything. So we were not able to move that forward. And as well, we didn't, we weren't able to bring a waiting period um, bill. We, we got, a, you know, Alyssa was amazing in the state house, really kind of changing hearts and minds, legislator by legislator. I worked um, alongside her kind of trying to lobby other legislators. Um, I do believe we need a waiting period. Um, Harvard data, you know, recently released shows. It doesn't matter one day or three days, but just some 20, at least a 24 hour period um, where, you know, a young person or someone going and buying a gun has to wait 24 hours. I think that's reasonable. Um, you know, death by um, self-inflicted gunshot wound is one of the highest rates of suicide for young males in the state of Vermont. So, you know, we it, it's a public safety issue, public health crisis. Um, and so I will be working hard with my colleagues to continue um, moving that legislation forward. Um, you know, I, I do think it's really, really important for the, you know, public safety, for the safety of our children, for the safety of our teachers and schools. We need to get this legislation through. Thank you so much. Tanya, we'll start with you with the next question. It's the COVID-19 question. And what do you think is the biggest impact from the last several months of shutdowns and how should the legislature move this state through the would, impacts and the future? Yeah. yeah, I would say it's difficult to name only one impact as it will depend entirely on who you talk to. And all of these issues are so intersectional. What we've seen with COVID-19 COVID crisis is that our social safety nets are glaringly thin. And in many places, they're broken completely. And the vast majority of people are one crisis away from complete catastrophe. We've also seen that all of these systems are so deeply interconnected and must be dealt with as a whole with foundational change that once and for all ensures dignity, justice, and freedom for all. Nobody can truly be free if they cannot afford to put food on their table or get the life-saving health care that they need, or if they're afraid to call the police for help because of the color of their skin. We need to focus our work and our energy and the investments that we make directly into our communities at the individual and small business level so that we can build a different future where we all can thrive. We need to invest in universal public broadband, fair and livable wages, climate justice, and healthcare justice. The economic and social impacts of this crisis will be felt for decades to come if we don't create truly intersectional and transformative change. 
What we've also seen, though, is we can do this. We shut this state down and mutual aid networks arose. I organized here in Essex to do that, to make sure that we protected our neighbors and that we kept people safe. And I think we have an opportunity with this crisis to rebuild something much better than what we had before. Thank you. I want you to remember your answers when we go to the next question, which is about the budget. Okay. Okay. Mary Beth Redmond, your view on COVID-19's impacts and how the legislature should move forward in supporting the state. So I sit on the House Human Services Committee and would normally, you know, pretty much talk about that in the context that Tanya just has, you know. So, so I'll take a slightly different kind of tact. Um, I think that one of the it, one of the biggest concerns I have is um, is is the intersection of the small small business getting small business back up and operational. Businesses are really really struggling at this point, um, and particularly the restaurant industry. We have the Essex experience here in Essex, where we have restaurants and different eateries and things. And everyone is really struggling because they have to, because of social distancing, they can't have their normal population of people in their facilities. So you have the small business piece, you have the childcare system. That's a, a big system that we've been working on trying to stabilize. It operates razor thin margins. Um, parents pay way too much and, and early childhood educators get paid way too little. And it's like a system that's always on the verge of kind of crumbling. So, um, but unless people have childcare, they can't go back to work. So it's this kind of push pull setup um, for the economy beginning to, you know, get it rolling again. So I feel like that's an issue. The broadband issue I feel is a huge issue. We saw the inequities around the state, not, not as much in Chittenden County, but in rural parts of the state, there were children who could not go to school at all for three months due to lack of broadband. So we have to figure this out. Um, we have to figure out, we've put $30 million of COVID monies into building out the last mile of certain projects around the state to hopefully help that. But um, that is an issue, broadband. Unless we get the broadband built out, people are not gonna relocate to Vermont and help energize our economy if they can't work from home and telecommute and use broadband. So if there are all of these intersection, you know, as Tanya said, intersectional issues that we need to address as a whole and not one, one kind of at a time. Thank you so much. Brian, your view of COVID-19's impacts and how we can ameliorate them. Well, sure. The the, in my opinion, the biggest effect of uh, COVID-19 on Vermont is I think we need to acknowledge that there are 15 to six Vermonters and their families who are no longer with us. And that is, um, and as well as like both Mary Beth and uh, Tanya spoke about, the crisis exposed further how many Vermonters are one paycheck away um, from those half hour long food lines. Um, the best way that the ledge can honor the sacrifices of those 56 and their families is to make minimizing the spread of COVID-19 our top priority. To me, that means more testing, more contact tracing, and opening the economy in ways that are safe, and to be, and reversibly, if we have a setback. There's no question, it's gonna be hard. There's no that we, way that we, can, that we can all stay co uh, cooped up in our houses until there's a vaccine. And we've come to depend on our school system for too many non-educated education-related services. Those services need to be supported um, from Montpelier if necessary. So but well, I believe that the, the democratic leadership's continued focus on COVID first was the right one. And the value, the Vermont value of helping out your neighbors is what we can, what is the best way that we can get through this. Thank you very much. I want to use just this opportunity to remind our viewers that we are with three candidates for two seats in the Democratic primary for state representative of Chittenden 81, which is Essex and a tiny bit of Essex Junction. And uh, we're going on to the next question now, which is about budget. And we'll start with you, Mary Beth Redmond. Given the unprecedented revenue and expense challenges that Vermont faces for this year and next year, what's your approach to the budget? How would you recommend that we move forward? 
Well, I want to say first off the bat that I feel like our Vermont state government has been responsible in balancing our budget every year. We don't, we're not required legally to do that, and we do it every year. And we've also done a good job of saving in our rainy day fund, which helped, you know, when all of these revenue shortfalls started to show up. But the reality is, yes, we are facing a massive um, revenue shortfall for fiscal year 21, um, estimates of over $300 million. And um, at the same time, um, we are committed not to, you know, having to pass on a massive tax increase to um, residents, to Vermonters. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's a combination of things. I think one, we need to look at ensuring that our wealthiest Vermonters are, are fairly paying their fair share in terms of income and property taxes. You know, we need to have another look, see at that and make sure so that the impact doesn't fall on low and middle income Vermonters. Um, I think that we need to, this is the COVID COVID moment, unfortunately, um, it has, a, has kind of an upside in that we're looking at our systems and our ways of doing business in new ways. We're looking at how we go to school differently, how we work. Um, and I do feel like there are efficiencies to be um, gathered from that kind of new way of doing business. So, so what are those and how can we, um, you know, provide or, or create savings from those new ways of doing business. I know that the administration is very focused on cutting. I don't think we can cut our way out of this. We are going to have to invest in the short term, maybe over a four to five year period, um, invest to get our economy rolling again. Um, that may require some borrowing. Um, there are, we have amazing minds on our Ways and Means and Appropriations Committees looking at this issue right now, and we'll be getting back to all of these budget considerations come August 25th. Um, so I think the, the priority is not raising taxes and looking at how we can um, do this in the fairest way possible. Thank you so much, Marie Beth Redmond. Brian Sheldon, your view of the Vermont budget and how to approach it. Well, my, what I would say is that no one knows exactly what the financial impact of COVID-19 will be because the crisis isn't over. Well, we do know that it's going to be severe. Uh, historically, and I'm talking about, we know from 2008 in particular, that governments that invested in their economies during downturns weathered their crises better than those that adopted austerity measures. So we, um, we need more information before making those hard choices. Um, and I look forward to working with our state's financial experts, such as Beth Pierce, and like, like Mary Beth said, the, 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 uh, the, the minds on um, ways and means and appropriations. Uh, in the meantime, the choices, budgets are about priorities, and we must, we must make sure to protect those among us who are the most vulnerable. So, what that's going to mean is that those of us who are more financially, uh, are better financial positioned to help the economy to recover should be, should be, should anticipate being asked to do so. Thank you very much, Brian Sheldon. Tanya Vihovsky, your view of how to solve the uh, financial challenges of this year and upcoming legislative budgets. As always, when we have budgeting, we need to take the information about what our state actually needs into that. And given the current crisis exacerbated by COVID-19, we know that the needs of Vermonters are likely to be high in the coming months and years. And we will, as Mary Beth said, need to be really creative and innovative in how we approach meeting those needs and creating savings. At, again, as a social worker, I, I've seen firsthand the impacts of the funding inequities. Often the communities and people who need the most resources have the least support. Given the projected budget shortfalls, we need to create diversified funding approaches that are paid into equitably. Of the 1.25 billion allocated in federal COVID relief funds, we have retained about 250 million, million for future shortages, and we need to invest these directly into our communities. We are well poised to weather the storm because we have done well in state government due to prior investments in reserve funds and rainy day funds. And these funds can help us to get through while we bolster our revenues with longer term solutions. We can make, a, we can make divestments 
in reactive policy and invest instead in proactive cost-saving community supports that will also better meet the needs of our community. We do need to resist austerity budgeting and invest in our long-term success as a state through investments to build sustainability and efficiency across our sectors. We know and history has showed us that when we invest in those who need it the most, that money stays in our local communities and bolsters our local economy. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, this is, we're getting close to the time, which is now if you have questions for each other. And I think Tanya, we would start, no, we would start with Brian. If you have a question for the other two candidates, either or both. Um, I, um, I, I have a question. Um, uh, I'm the chair of the Essex Democrats and I plan to caucus with the, with the Democrats in Montpelier. And I was just wondering what, uh, with what party my two opponents will caucus with in Montpelier. Okay, very good. Tanya? Um, I am likely to caucus with the progressives. Okay, thank you. Mary Beth? I, I will definitely uh, caucus with the Democrats. And how about you, Brian? Who will you be caucusing with? I'll be Democrats. caucusing with the Democrats, yeah. I imagine. Okay, very good. And then, um, Tanya, do you have questions for your, the other candidates? I um, am curious for, for both of you, just thinking about, you know, all of these intersectional challenges that we have, where you would sort of prioritize our first steps, particularly around racial equity. Very good. Thank you. Mary Beth, why don't you start? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a member of the Social Equity Caucus. So we have been, um, you know, all of our caucuses ended when the session ended late in June, but the Social Equity Caucus continues. We meet every Wednesday morning. So we are continuing to talk about all of the issues that we need to bring forward legislation for um, August when we return around policing. We're going to do some further legislation there. Um, but I think, you know, the deeper question for me is what work do we need to do personally, collectively as a, as a body, you know, personally and individually, collectively as a legislature, and then looking at systematic racism and inequity. And what are the, I mean, there is no shortage of work that we need to do in transforming these systems. So um, it's, it's a huge body of work. I do feel optimistic with um, what's happening globally around all of the rising up. I do feel like it's giving us the momentum and the critical mass and the attention of legislators to really focus on things. So I, I find it a hopeful time. I really feel like I hope we can make some great progress Thank toward you. greater racial justice. Thank you, Mary Beth. Brian Sheldon. Well, I want to agree with Mary Beth in that um, from a personal level um, that I think that uh, that, that I need to do more listening than, um, than talking. Um, however, I can't stop being an engineer, so I have some suggestions. Um, I do support uh, uh, S-219, which Governor Scott just signed into law. This law makes chokeholds illegal for the police and requires the Vermont State Police to wear body cameras. Um, I support it because I never believe we should make the perfect be the enemy of the good. We need to go further. For one thing, most policing in Vermont, including in Essex, is performed by municipal police departments, not the Vermont State Police. EPD should also have body cameras and the state should fund their purchase through the reallocation of funds away from military style policing. Another concern I have with, uh, with uh, S-219 is that there aren't any regulations on when and if body cameras may be shut off. Dirty cops around the country have leveraged this loophole to turn their cameras off at, uh, let's just say strategic times, um, now, there are technical solutions here. There are camera models that automatically record and store to the crowd, or store to the cloud, excuse me. Uh, but we need to test those here because as both Tanya and uh, Mary Beth alluded to, sometimes Vermont's uh, broadband infrastructure might not hold it up. So, but and I think that I'm, uh, as, a, as a software consultant and engineer, that I would be a good person to help direct that testing. All right, very good. Mary Beth, do you have questions for the other candidates? 
Yeah, I mean, mine's more of a philosophical question. Um, it, you know, my experience has, has shown me that it's easy to go in with um, kind of this very idealistic view of what you want to have happen. And then you get into situations where you need to compromise and you need to give up some of what you want to have happen. And I'm curious if um, how my opponents feel like they will deal with that how will will they be willing to compromise will they be willing to give up pieces of what they want um I, i'm curious you know what their response to that would be brian sheldon why don't you start well i think i just said it i don't think that we should let the perfect be the enemy of the good um i was um, i was actually in montpelier when um when mary beth was railing on the floor um for giving the Forest, uh, or the hardest working Vermonters are raised, you know. And meanwhile, um, there were there was a press conference going on in Montpelier saying that we're going to, uh, if it doesn't go further, we're going to uh, we're going to have primary challenges against uh, against people that don't push further. I don't think that that's the right way to get real progress. We need to focus on um, um, trying to get uh, trying to get uh, progress and not perfection. Thank you, Tanya. Your view on this question. I absolutely know that compromise is deeply important. And we, I do that in my job as a social worker every day, working with children and families and working embedded within our school system. I think we need to be thoughtful about those comp compromises and make sure that we're not compromising with people's lives and really fighting for the very best that we can. I have found time and time again in my social work practice that when we come together with openness, and with a willingness to hear the different perspectives that people have, we are almost always able to craft something together that meets our needs and make sure that everyone has what they need and is heard. Compromise is the name of the game when it comes to the work that I do as a social worker. I'd also like to just check in and see if it's possible to answer my question around equity. I know we've sort of circled and let the other candidates answer their own questions and just want to see if that was okay. Of course, please. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to my question on equity, you know, I have fought since I was a graduate student to have mandated racial equity credits yearly for all social workers. And I think that as Mary Beth pointed out, we have to be reflective both at the individual and the systems level. And I would fight to ensure that all of our state funded professions and professions like teachers and nurses are having that space and time to do that reflection. And it's only one small step. I furthermore think we need to make sure that we're listening to the communities most being harmed and lifting their voices up to help us craft policies that will help their communities. Thank you. Mary Beth, did you want to say more on the question you asked folks on the philosophical approach to sure, legislating? Sure. No, I just, I, I know I'm an idealist. And so I've really had a, a crash course in the importance of um, collaborating and coming together and really figuring out, um, you know, there's a lot of strategy in passing legislation and really figuring out how, um, how to get the biggest win for your constituents, the biggest win for Vermonters in terms of what really lifts them up, what um, supports their dignity and their economic security and well-being. Um, so I think I, I've really come to a new profound appreciation for compromise and working with others. And um, I feel as though um, I've, um, I, I've spent the last two years building some really nice coalitions in the different caucuses I've been part of, the Climate Solutions Caucus, the Women's Caucus, and the Social Equity Caucus, as ways to kind of build those relationships so that we can work together and compromise and figure out how to carry the football over the line. So thanks for the opportunity to answer that. Thank you very much. So we're going to combine this question with your closing comments. So you have a couple minutes. Um, and that is, what are your priorities for the next biennium? What do you think is the most important piece of legislation that the House can take up and why? And, um, and then you can wrap that into your closing comments. So Tanya, why don't you go ahead? Absolutely. First and foremost, we need to ensure that our continued coping and recovery from COVID is centered on the people and our local economies and small businesses. 
we need to use this as an opportunity to build an economic system that does not leave more than 50% of Vermonters unable to afford an unexpected $500 expense. We need bold leadership that will fight for economic, racial, social, and environmental justice. We can only do this by recognizing that all of these issues are interconnected and therefore our solutions must be intersectional. We need to create bold transformational change on many policy fronts simultaneously to make Vermont a place where all people can thrive. A comprehensive framework of policies to address climate change through a shift to a just and sustainable economy uh, economic model would be a primary focus of what I would hope to that we focus on. And this would include protections for native lands, health care, fair and livable wages, affordable housing, paid family leave, and fully funding our colleges and post-secondary training programs to build the workforce for transition to energy sustainability and a green economy. We can't make the changes that we know we need on the backs of the people who we know are already struggling. I want to fight to do this and to, and I'm running because I believe that we have to have all of these voices, especially those traditionally underrepresented if we want to make these kinds of changes and fight for these kinds of bold policy. We have to lift up the voices of the young people who are struggling to stay here and the marginalized communities who don't feel safe and allow them to help us solve the inequitable systems that impact their daily lives. COVID-19 has shown us on so many levels that we're not okay, and too many people are struggling on the edges. What we have been able to do in this immediate crisis and catastrophe is make really bold changes, and I believe we can continue to build on that. And I believe that when we do that, we will build a vision for Vermont that's prepared, resilient, equitable, and sustainable, and we'll take all of our voices to Montpelier so we can build a Vermont that works for all of us and secure our future. Thank you very much. Mary Beth Redman, what are your priorities for the next biennium and your closing comments? So I sit on the Human Services Committee. They call it the People's Committee. Um, so my priorities really come from some of the work that we've been doing in that committee. And I really feel like the childcare um, situation is really severe. We've just lost two major programs in Chittenden County um, at St. Michael's College and UVM, 90 slots um, for childcare. And um, this system is kind of really on the edge. Um, so I do feel like we need to stabilize that system so that people can go back to work. Because as we know, moms, primarily take those caregiving responsibilities, unfortunately. Um, paid family leave, we have got to get paid family leave through the legislature this year. Um, it is essential, it is a workforce strategy. If we want to attract more Vermonters to come here, we need paid family leave. It is a win-win for business. Um, the broadband issue, um, we have got to build out our broadband, um, support um, these community districts that are forming to create broadband networks that serve local downtown communities. Um, this is another way to really get our economy moving. Um, and the Global Warming Solutions Act, we must hold ourselves accountable to emissions reduction goals. Transportation in Vermont is a 40% creator of emissions, and we are the only state in New England with increasing emissions. We must get this under control. Um, I love my job. I love being in the legislature. I love what I do every day. I love hearing from constituents. Um, I feel like I have provided excellent constituent service in a very, very dark time for many people. And I want the chance to continue that work, to continue to get to know my constituents, to continue to support them, to continue to bring them good information from state government so that they can make informed choices in their lives. Thank you, Mary Beth Redman. Brian Sheldon, your priorities for the next biennium and your closing comment. Sure. The, the COVID-19 crisis has changed the world and, and with it, Vermont. It's gonna be rough for everyone. But I believe the best way out of this crisis is all Vermonters to continue to work together. If elected, 
I, my priorities are the same as the House Democratic Caucus's priorities. Let's focus on COVID-19 safety first and then recovering the economy next. And um, then if we accomplish those things, I would like to uh, be the hundredth vote for a paid family leave program. I will be a voice for those values in, in Montpelier. And I will, be a, I will be a positive and effective voice for those things. Because I agree with Tanya, there's too many people struggling. We all wanna fix those things. But I, as an engineer, I know how to craft solutions to complex problems. I, I can't think of a better time for our lead, to have leaders who listen to everyone and then let science and data guide their decisions. Um, also, as the chair of the Essex Democrats, I've already been building the relationships needed uh, and, the, uh, and the grassroots uh, community of Essex Democrats so that we can, so that the Essex Democrats can be in the room when the solutions affecting Essex are crafted. I hope that I can earn one of your two votes in the August 11th Democratic primary. Thank you very much, Brian Sheldon. And thank you, everyone. Tanya Vihofsky, Mary Beth Redmond, and Brian Sheldon, three candidates for two seats in the Democratic primary for District 8-1, which includes Essex and a small part of Essex Junction. The um, day of voting is the, just remind me again, I want to get it right. You say August, August 11th. August 11th. Right now. <laughs> August 11th. Um, Early voting is open right now. Go down to the town office or go to mvp.vermont.gov. Now, the Secretary of State reports that 10 times the number of absentees have been requested. So that's you'll right. Be, you'll be running with the big crowd when you request your absentee ballot. I also want to thank Kevin Harms and the staff from Town Meeting Television for supporting the continuing coverage of the primary and general elections in 2020. And thank you, of course, all of our viewers. You can watch these programs here at ch.17 on our channels, 1087 on Comcast, 17 on BT, 317, and also on YouTube, channel 17, Town Meeting Television. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.